Hello! Welcome to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. I can't believe it's been 18 months since we've done this in person. So thank you so much for, for coming and and being here, it's like, it, it, it's really amazing that we're able to do this. Um, thank you to the KGB Bar for, for having us. Um, so I think everybody here knows what this is, right? If you don't know this series, raise your hand and I'll, I'll do the spiel. I'll do the spiel anyway. Yep. Fantastic <laughs> Fiction at KGB, right? Monthly reading series, been going since the late 90s um, for over two decades, right? So. Um, Last March, Ellen and I were like, yeah, I think we probably shouldn't do it in person anymore. And then 18 months online, virtually, uh, we had guests. Uh, I was asked just a minute ago uh, how many countries uh, we had. I think it was almost 10 countries. I have to do the official tally. But we had people from all over the world, uh, Barbados, Pakistan, uh, South yeah. Africa, England, Australia, Canada. Um, <coughs> So uh, that was really great, and uh, just you know, pandemic sucked obviously, but it was it was great to be able to uh, really connect with people who probably couldn't make it here otherwise. So that was uh, that was awesome. But um, you know, we're back in person now. We have a, a video recording we're trying to do, so we'll see we'll see how it goes. Um, it's our first time trying it. It's not live. We're going to record the readings tonight, and then stitch them together with some, uh, some technical magic. But uh, yeah, so just um, thank you to everybody here for uh, supporting the series this whole time. Thank you very much. Uh, it really means a lot to us, that those, those of you who've uh, supported us financially otherwise. And uh, always got to remind you when, when we're here, please also support the bar. Buy a drink if you can. Uh, supports the bar and you support the bar you support the series so uh, we we, uh, we also we definitely appreciate that so um, yeah our uh, our first reader tonight is uh, is a friend of mine uh, I've known Mike I don't know how long uh, a while I think I met him at, at reader con we were uh, he, he was like secretly passing me his private uh, brew that he brews uh, his beer that he brews <laughs> Quite, quite good, I might add. He grows his own hops. He's, he's an expert um, brewer. And uh, if you want to learn all about microbes, he's your man. <laughs> so actually him and, uh, wh where's Raj? He's hiding right there. Raj and Kana, they were on a podcast together. Um, I'm blanking on the name of your podcast. What's it called again? Spirited, Spirited Discourse. There's like a three-hour podcast of them talking just about microbes. It's actually fascinating um, to check that out. But uh, yeah, our first reader is, is Michael J. DeLuca. Uh, Michael has published 30 plus short stories in markets, including Apex, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Mythic Delirium, and Interfictions. His debut novella, Night Roll, was a finalist for the Crawford Award in 2020. He's also the publisher of Reckoning, a journal of creative writing on environmental justice. He lives in the rapidly suburbifying post-industrial woodlands north of Detroit with partner, kids, cats, and microbes. Is Mike DeLuca. Can I or shall I adjust? I shall not. I think it's okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, this is a book about Detroit, about uh, being an insomniac new mom in Detroit. Uh, and I thought it appropriate to start in the middle with the part that is sort of 
coming out of your cocoon back into society from having had a little baby who keeps you up all night and makes you hallucinate. Uh, so what you need to know here is that Aileen is a new mom. Uh, she and her partner emigrated to Detroit from the East Coast, and then he disappeared under mysterious circumstances, uh, and she made a friend, Virgil, who then uh, borrowed her beloved bike to ride in this thing called Night Roll, which is a sort of bike parade that happens in the middle of the night, and he too disappeared under mysterious circumstances. <clears throat> Aileen put Christian in their swaddle, carefully under the mailboxes at the bottom of the stairs, then went back up and dragged the rocker down, bump, 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 along with diaper bag and a blanket she couldn't imagine needing to be safe. The breastfeeding pillow she lost off the top of the pile, so then went, went back up to retrieve it, bringing Christian, because they were fussing, then up and down one last time, feeling like the fairy oarsman in the riddle, having forgotten the enormous smoothie cascading sweat over the kitchen counter. She flumped into the rocker, pressed the cold flask of smoothie to her temple, and looked up at the full moon. It was red, but she didn't put any stock of superstition into that. Her tiny family cluttered the sidewalk like two loved trash, awaiting a city hauler that would never come. She wouldn't have thought of this moon as a milestone at all if they weren't sitting out under it, this ineffable, questionable presence at the head of a caravan of fairy-lit cyclists. The weeks had not flown by, but they had survived, would keep surviving. The vast supply of frozen casseroles, pickles, preserves, and freeze-dried vegetable protein she'd accumulated in a frenzy before Christian was dwindling. She could see the back of her cupboards. Just in time, like magic, her new friends had supplied her with an apparently inexhaustible cornucopia of veg. Her savings were about to run out. Just in time, like magic, her new friends had, had found her a job at a bike shop. She started tomorrow, today. It was just past midnight. Time still wasn't something she could keep hold of, though after tonight, when the baby books, what the baby books called the fourth trimester, that transitional space between life and the womb would be technically over. People came and went at the marble bar, laughing, smoking, moving through linear time streams she remembered the shape of but forgot, had forgotten how to occupy. She couldn't imagine having a drink right now. She was so tired it might kill her. She could sleep as soon as the bikes went by. Mama, Christian said, I'm hungry. The voice was small and clear. She saw their lips move. It was only natural. Children grew, they developed, learned, changed. Milk, said Aileen. Milk, said Christian with great confidence and finality. Aileen picked them up and bared her breast. Sing, said Christian. Aileen sang, not a lullaby or a nursery rhyme, but the sample of a dub song she'd probably misheard at the block party. I know you'll never let me down over and over, as Christian fastened onto her breast and sucked hard. She should not imagine her personal individuality and essence being sucked out of her and into Christian. She knew it could only make this harder. She would not have nightmares about her own child. But to overcome dreams required willpower, resources that could be acquired only through sleep. With Andrew to support her, Aileen had been a person in her own right, unique, even independent. Now Christian took precedence. She could have friends only because those friends pitied her and wanted to give of themselves to help her. And what did she have for them in return except what Christian could give? Except love. Something hummed in her ear, a mosquito. She slapped at it. Christian slept, a three-month-old blob of fragile adorableness. Her smoothie sat in its pool of condensation on the sidewalk. She sucked. The door to the bar swung open. Real music overwhelmed the chorus in her head as partiers spilled out onto the sidewalk, some carrying bottles, lighting cigarettes, joints, the faded blue dot of a vaporizer. A car approached, jostling and vibrating over the wrecked pavement, accompanied by a quiet, warning whine. Teardrop-shaped, silver, not a mark on it. Moving through intermittent pools of light from unbroken street lamps like a fish through the deep, she bolted out of her rocker. This had happened before. Voices raised on the opposite curb. Joints were extinguished. A few bottles were hucked away into the dark. The spectral car slowed. The windows descended. There was no one inside. A bright light flashed three times. In its glare, the partiers on the opposite curb were momentarily frozen in place. The window rose. The car accelerated away. Fucking drone? Somebody threw a bottle, which exploded harmlessly on the street. This was followed by more cursing. A dustpan and broom were brought from the bar, and the offender shoved out to clean up the hazard. 
Down Holden, through a wash of faint red moonlight and city light, came the first rider. Aileen scooped Christian up and clutched them close. The bike wasn't like any she'd seen. There might once have been tires. The metal rims cast sparks off the pavement. There were no brakes. The rider sat upright, relaxed, knees bowed out to the sides, barely touching the handlebars, giving Aileen the impression of a trick rider worn past the last thread, yet so comfortable in the saddle it was easier, for the moment, on this straight and level course, to keep on pedaling than to fall. A long coat indistinct in age, cut, or color fanned around them in tatters, echoing the shape and motion of the gnarled, colorless locks. So long they all but dragged on the road, the rider's face was in shadow. Just behind the elf, Virgil bent over the handlebars of Aileen's beautiful blue custom cruiser, riding hard, stood up on the pedals like he was climbing the Alps, but gaining no ground. That the elf existed at all, a being of flesh and blood who could be seen by moonlight, streetlight, wasn't something she could take in. That Virgil had been alive this whole past month and had not shown his face at Aileen's door, not to bring some piece of trash to make her life easier, not to return her bike, not even to say hello, hurt. Not the way Andrew had, but too much like it. She couldn't let them go by. She opened her mouth to speak, to say, Hey, it's me. Remember me? What the fuck? That's my bike. Give it back. Come back. She couldn't. What was this? What was the elf? Being outside of time, was it something they had in common? Existing a world apart from the experience of people who weren't mothers of infant children, who could pound beers at five minutes to midnight and throw them away into the street after half-smoked joints, and there would be no consequences. No one who depended on them for breath and sustenance would be placed in mortal peril. Was it the same? She needed to understand. She stepped off the curb into the street. Christian wriggled, dug toes into her breast. The riders approached. They were moving so slow. A fraction of a lifetime before the elf would have had to swerve to avoid her, she lost her nerve and jumped back. The elf did not swerve. The strange bike sailed by, scattering sparks at her feet. The streetlight revealed their face, fleetingly, something between a laughing death's head and a ritual mask. Then they wrinkled, wrinkles contracting like scales around a dark eye eminently alive, human. It took forever for them to pass and be gone, then almost as long again for the main body of night rollers to appear, bringing music, slowing to wave and pop wheelies and groove in their saddles, encouraged by the marble bar crowd. Morris rode out in front, in third place if it had been a race, far, far behind the elf and Virgil. She found Omar with the middle of the pack, but out at the edge along the side he knew she would be watching from. As Morris whizzed past the streetlight on a road bike three times fancier and higher tech than her own, still probably only a tenth the cost of the auto car, she realized she ought to have had something for them. Heirloom tomato slices, little cups of smoothie to hold out as to a tour rider before a climb. Her fingers closed around a fresh, unused burp cloth stuffed into her bra strap, reassuringly soft. She drew it out and held it aloft. Omar's fingers met hers as he took it. He threw it over one shoulder as he rode on. Okay, then we skip a bit. Wait, not that much. Okay, so now she's going to the first day of her new job. Wheels on Fire was at 16th and Michigan, catty corner across Roosevelt Park from Michigan Central Depot. Long abandoned, suddenly gutted and renovated into an upscale shopping and commercial center, the old train station hummed with activity. Auto cars deposited and collected corporate suits and nuclear families from the colonnaded entryway. A drone whizzed overhead. From the north side of Michigan Ave, across four lanes of car traffic, two bike lanes and two parking lanes, Aileen felt as isolated from it as if it were a desert vision. Homeless people, who used to sleep in Roosevelt Park, now did so on the opposite sidewalk, evidenced by nests of sleeping bags against the walls below the storefronts. Chicory blossomed blue and robust from cracks in the brick. At the curb, Omar tried gamely but failed to help get Christian out of the car seat and rebundled to her chest. Sorry I can't pick you up. My cousin needs the car, and anyway my shift doesn't end till 2 a.m. He promised the car seat would be waiting in the alley behind Holden and Trumbull when she got home. Good luck, he said. Get in here, said Rosaria from the open door, and let's see what you can do. In her previous life, 
Aileen had spent two years getting paid, basically, to make the same microgreen salad over and over, dressed with a reduction of sour cherries and Belgian ale vinegar, wild mustard flour garnish applied with tweezers, for people like those debarking from their private auto cars to shop at the Mirage across the street. But no restaurant wanted kitchen staff with a three-month-old strapped between their breasts. She'd known that a year ago, when her plan had been nothing like this, mothering full-time at least until Christian was ready for daycare. Now she couldn't even think that far ahead. She knew she could fix a bike. She figured she could sell them. With Morris's recommendation, the owner had believed it too. She needed the work. She needed the money. Inside, it wasn't cool, just dark. A fan blew deep and throaty from somewhere back in the warehouse space. Rosaria had red lips and lacquer black hair that re-sculpted itself as she moved, which she did with a clipped, fearsome energy. She made only the tokenest of efforts to conceal the black bike shorts she wore under a loud, short dress. Her legs were amazing. I'm hiring you because of her, she said, nodding to Christian, who gazed at a fixed point to the left of the mural, too far away for them to see, and blew spit bubbles. They, corrected Aileen, almost without hesitation, and allowed herself a little bit of pride. A crease appeared between Rosaria's black brows, and she moved on without pausing, leading Aileen between rows of refurbished no-frills cruisers and commuter bikes, fixies, fat tire bikes, high-end racing bikes, all the way to the very back corner of the showroom, past the workshop, past kid trailers and a couple of rep recumbent trikes. I don't care that you're not from here, said Rosaria, as long as you intend to stay. I want that baby to grow up a part of this place. We need people to grow up here and love it, fight for it, make it worth living in. We need people not to run away. Okay, said Aline, who had nowhere to run to. You know what this is? A beautiful eggshell gray bruiser of an E-assist cargo bike slumbered under a light haze of dust. Aileen nodded, trying not to drool. It was groceries, laundry, trips to the doctor, to the river, to work and back, to school and back when it came to that. It was a future. Rosaria made a rude gesture. As far as I'm concerned, a bike that costs as much as a car defeats the purpose. Maybe they'd mean something if they were mass-produced instead of custom. I keep one around in case some industry asshole walks in one day and wants to keep my business open for a year single-handed. But just look. The E-Assist goes up to 30 kph. Battery only lasts for 20 minutes of use, but you're not meant to rely on it. Charges in something like two hours from an ordinary wall plug. Regenerative raking on all three wheels. LED headlights, taillights. Some people think it's cheating. I used to think so, but I've tried it. It's kind of freeing. It lets you compete with cars, in short bursts anyway, which is all you need. It feels weirdly safe. Test ride it, you'll see. You'd think it's heavy, but it's not. She wrapped one hand around a place where the dust had already been disturbed and hefted the whole thing off the floor. And look, here. The mounting place is for a car seat. Why are you showing me this? She shrugged. You'd have noticed anyway, and I want you to have something to want. Keeping myself and my baby alive isn't enough? No, it isn't. People need hope. Apparently, they'd all been conspiring against her, for her. Rosaria put her to work, for now as a trial, tuning up the huge collection of decrepit bikes from the back warehouse. There were hundreds, some rusted beyond repair, some without seats or brakes or wheels, some just in need of oil and adjustment. People donate them. Sometimes I pick one up from the side of the road, if it's clear nobody's coming back for it, and it isn't already turning to dirt. They don't need to be beautiful, just rideable, safe. Mostly I give them away, to churches, community groups. The idea is to get them to people who use them. One bike near the back looked like her blue racer, but two generations older, the chrome all brown with rust, brake pads and tires rotting away. You should sell that one for scrap, she told Rosaria. They don't make that kind of fittings anymore. Each of these bikes had a story. Each had belonged to a person, a series of people, who had grown up or moved on to, or given up or died. People from the block party, people like those buzzing in and out of the mall, people she'd never met and couldn't imagine. Aileen picked out a smallish kid's bike and with gritted teeth managed to heave it up onto a repair stand. The books said it was okay to start lifting things again. She had to start somewhere. She set to work scouring rust from the gears with steel wool and a spray bottle of solvent, careful to keep Christian out of the line of fire. The nice thing about having a baby strapped to your chest, their head was always available for kissing. Thank you, she told them quietly. 
you are the hardest and worst and also the best thing that's ever happened to me. Rosaria helped a few customers, not many considering the nerve and never-ending flow of traffic across the street. Was the whole city like this? Had it always been? A divide, a chasm, the kind of people who ever bothered to visit the far side of the street and the kind who didn't, the kind who left bikes abandoned to be devoured by time and the kind who took them home and fixed them. Aileen could feel the energy pent up in Rosaria, the way she let it out only under tight control and wished for some small part of that energy for her own. At the end of the day, her shoulders and forearms and lower back ached from the work and from carrying the baby, and her fingers stung from a combination of greased, ru grease, rust, oil, and solvents. She just wanted to fall over. First, she had to wait for the bus. I'd offer you a ride home, but Rosaria trailed off with something close to a smirk, pulling a pink helmet from under the counter. From the bus stop in the lengthening light of afternoon, the shadow of the train depot marching past her, Aileen pined for the cargo bike, lurking immaculate and mocking at the back of the storeroom. Skipping some... Just when she finally needed him, when she had questions, important questions, Virgil's shade would not appear. She sat in the rocker while Christian slept, in the full deep scrutiny of the fan, Virgil's overdue library books spread out in front of her on the floor, looking out at the day turning orange along Holden, waiting for the long hands of the almost dead locust tree's shadow on the corner of Sterling to reach as far as her doorstep, waiting for sleep and dreams that wouldn't come, thinking of all the rooms in Virgil's house she hadn't been into, the bedrooms, the bathroom, the basement, whether any of them had windows that worked, if anything at all was left of the people who owned that house, where he went to the bathroom, if not the bathroom, where he slept, why? Why are you doing this? What did you think it would achieve? Or was it just some crazy notion? And even if it was, how could you forget about us? She'd been on his calendar the very next day. When she slept, she was visited not by Virgil's shade, but Christian's, their future self, the little toe-headed boy girl she had biked past in another dream, talking to some older kids sitting on a curb in some other neighborhood she'd never be able to see until she could bike past it, talking matter-of-factly about a life she couldn't access, a life formulated on weekend block parties and summers off from school and a stable, patient, trusting, absent only because working mother. She woke and she wanted that, all of it except her absence. So make it happen, she told herself, telling Christian. So make one yourself, Rosaria told her the first thing Monday morning, Knuckles placed on her hips so her already greasy fingers wouldn't smudge her rainbow dress, cocking her head appraisingly at the beautiful, sleek cargo bike, flushed from shadow at the back of the shop like a great elk from a thicket when she flicked on the lights. Do it cheap and ugly. You don't need battery backup. Look at your calves. Do it heavy. You don't need titanium. Use steel. I'm not set up for metal work yet, but it wouldn't be that hard. Get two bikes. Take whatever you want from the warehouse. I don't care. We'll get more. Chop one of them in half. Fuse two rear forks to fit two wheels on an axle. Use the rest to build the cargo bed. Find help. This is Detroit. You can't throw a piece of rotten brick without hitting an unemployed machine shop worker. It's about finding one who's not an asshole. She bought a bike online. A heavy, steel-framed mountain bike at least 20 years old, in perfect condition, as if it had spent that time pursuing the elf through some empty limbo while everything else aged around it. She and Christian took a bus up Livernoy to Sherwood Forest on a Sunday to collect it from an old woman's garage, half decomposed to loam. Aileen sat with her under a huge, sick oak in the barren backyard of a brick Victorian, listening to her talk about her son, who had helped her list the bike, who wouldn't be needing it anymore because he'd moved away, the opposite of Aileen, except that he still had a mom to come back to, and a home to come back to her in. She paid twenty dollars above the asking price because she could. Walking the bike with Christian strapped to her chest through deeply shaded neighborhoods of long-ago wealth, slowly rising from and falling into ruin, felt at first ridiculously indulgent, as if she could throw a leg over and take off any time she wanted, then impatient and incredibly slow, then exhausted, and finally stupid. She wouldn't be able to ride it for months. The hard plastic saddle hurt just to look at. The sharp pedal dug into her leg every pace and a half until she was leaning on it like a crutch, limping. Any time now. Morris found her another bike like the first, 
the same make and model, a few years older, almost as well preserved. She saw him out the bus window coming home from Wheels on Fire. He'd rigged it so he could pull it behind him on his own bike, a ghost bike with an absent rider. She knocked on the window, and he waved, then pumped harder, putting on speed, outpacing the bus when it stopped at a light. He was waiting when they got home, flushed and smiling, his great shoulders heaving. He even carried the bike upstairs. The two bikes together, leaning end, ag end to end against the kitchen island, were so beautiful she almost didn't want to touch them. Suddenly she could see it, see them taken apart and refused, made one, and then it was happening. Omar had to talk her into actually going to see it being done. She wasn't allowed into the machine shop to see the sparks fly, not if she wanted to take Christian. And without Christian, what was the point? You are, said Omar gently, and arranged for Gladys to take Christian for an afternoon. She wore protective earmuffs and wraparound plastic glasses and stood with arms protectively folded around her belly in an artificially cold, vibrating warehouse space full of hammering, sawing, laughter, lasers, and old machines burnished with the oils of human hands, the floor worn with track marks, the cavernous ceiling strung with harsh lights, watching the two bikes divided and reformed by a molten knife. When she came out again into the day, her jaw hurt from clenching and her ears rung, and she wanted very much to hold on to something green, or Christian. And then there was nothing left but to run shifter and brake cables, order the hardware to allow the cargo bed to accept the car seat, install it, and a bell, head and tail lights, a wide cushioned seat, and look into baby bike helmets, and look around the alley behind her building for a loop of iron to lock it to so she wouldn't have to haul the bike up and down stairs. She went across the street to Virgil's for the calendar, in and out as quickly as she could, opening no doors, trying hard not to breathe. She hung the calendar on her own apartment door when she got home, flipped ahead past pictures of elk drinking from streams and ice-bound waterfalls in the pristine, inaccessible peninsulas of the north. The last Saturday in October, two days past Christian's half-birthday, she marked in block letters like Virgil's, Roll. It was Halloween. That's the end of that. Thank you all for coming. Cheers. <laughs>
Um, you're going to have a good time. Um, let me grab my stuff. Uh, I'm going to read two short things um, from the latest books that, that uh, Alan just mentioned. Um, uh, one from the album of Dr. Moreau. Here, I'll point the light at the beautiful cover. There you go. Uh, this is a uh, sort of a, a sequel reboot of uh, uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. But I thought to myself, well, if, if there were a bunch of animal-human hybrids, uh, why wouldn't they form a boy band? Um, and, uh, and then I thought, well, OK, so if H.G. Wells and Agatha Christie did a lot of cocaine together, uh, what book would they write? And this turned out to be the book. It's a murder mystery, a, cl a locked room murder mystery, where uh, the boys, um, Tusk the Elephant Boy, uh, Matt the Bat, he's the funny one, uh, Bobby O the Ocelot, He's, uh, he's the cute one. Um, and uh, Devin the Bonobo, he's the romantic one. If you know anything about bonobos, uh, you may understand how gentle the rubbing goes a long way toward making it romantic. Um, and then uh, Tim the Pangolin, that this chapter is gonna, this little scene's gonna be about Tim. Uh, I had to explain to several people what a pangolin was, but you know, those, those little armadillo guys uh, who unfairly got blamed for a lot of uh, COVID. Uh, I, I felt bad for those guys. Uh, they were duking it out with the bats uh, for a long time. Um, but um, yeah, so it's a locked room murder mystery in which their sleazy manager, Dr. M, is found clawed to death in his hotel room and uh, Bobby O, the ocelot, wakes up next to him uh, covered in blood. Um, as will happen in an after party after a big... Uh, after a big uh, concert. And so um, the detective in the story, De Detective Delgado, Lucia Delgado, and her assistant, uh, uh, her partner, Detective Banks, are questioning each of, the, each of the members of the boy band. And they finally get to Tim the Pangolin. And so here we go. Um, oh, one other person I should mention is Kat. Is the, uh, road she'll show up in the scene. She's the sort of queen of the roadies. She's the tour manager who runs the whole tour. Tim had been dreading this moment. All morning he lay curled in his cave of couch cushions, quietly freaking the hell out. What was going to happen to Bobby O? If they freed Bobby, would they accuse Tim or Cat? Someone else in the band? What if they made everybody stay in this hotel and he never got to burrow? In times like these, nothing chilled him out more than a good excavation session. But there was nowhere to dig in this hotel, so he'd gone to his backup stress management technique, contemplating future dooms. For years, after escaping the barge, they all were uh, escaped from a, a secret science barge, as will happen in these kind of stories. He imagined all the ways the CIA could abduct the band and subject them to medical experiments. But when the government failed to materialize, that particular dread lost its sting. Most of last year, he'd soothed himself with thoughts of Y2K. This story also takes place in the year 2000. Um, and it was a big disappointment when the digital apocalypse failed to appear on New Year's Eve. Climate change was an up-and-comer, and, and planet-killing asteroids were good for, a, good for a quick, comforting jolt. But when all dooms failed, he contemplated the terror of shell cancer. Shell cancer had not yet been discovered, as far as he knew. Uh, but the problem with being a genetic one-off was that no one, absolutely no one, could tell you about likely pangolin-human hybrid diseases and which predispos predispositions to them were waiting in his genome. If there were a significant population of PHHs, uh, who'd been living on the planet for a couple hundred years, or even better, a community of American PHHs uh, who'd immigrated, say, in the 1800s to Pittsburgh, uh, attracted by the region's many mining opportunities, um, and then turned its famous Pango Town into a vibrant community noted for its underground homes and termite restaurants, and who, despite having fallen on hard times when the steel industry collapsed in the 1970s, had nevertheless persevered and found work in the nascent knowledge, knowledge economy, thanks in part to the species' obsessive focus, work ethic, and a tendency toward nearsightedness that made them perfect for screen work. Why, if 
if that had happened, there would have been statistics on the rate of shell cancer, Epidemi uh, epidemiologists charting its spread, and teams of smart, highly educated homo pangolins working on a cure or, or at least a treatment cream. He heard rustling outside his upholstered cave, and then Kat said, I brought you breakfast. A tangy smell wafted through a gap in the cushions. Come on now, Kat said, her voice growing firm. These detectives don't have all day. Besides, you don't want me to throw out fresh grub. Tim eased his snout back into the room. Grubs? Kat extended her free hand. Up oh, there, there you go. This won't take long, Detective Degado said. Tim sat on the floor with the bag of snacks between his knees. Cat handed him his glasses, and the sinister blurs resolved into a Hispanic woman and 30-ish white man whose head would soon be as hairless as Tim's. He introduced himself as Detective Banks. I didn't do it, Tim said, then immediately regretted it. Nothing made you sound guiltier than instantly denying it. Bobby didn't either. Everybody seems to agree on that, Detective Banks said. He pulled out a tape recorder. You mind if I... Oh, oh, God. You missed one, love, Kat said. She pointed to the corner of her mouth, right there. Tim used his foreclaw to push the white beetle larvae between his lips. Detective Degato said, Can you tell me where you were last night from the time you left the party until this morning? I was here, Tim said. That's the truth, Cat added. He, he got <laughs> under the cushions as soon as we got in, and he hasn't moved since. And you, Banks asked her. Well, I took the bet. I was here until 7.30, and then I took the elevator down and walked over to the venue to start the teardown. Oh, and stopped at Starbucks to get coffee for the crew. Then I got a call from Matt saying that Dr. M was dead, the cops were coming, and Tim wouldn't come out of his room. Sorry, Tim said. It seems like you've had a rough time, Delgado said. What do you mean, Tim asked. Well, we heard that you attacked Dr. M last night. Well, because Dr. M was being an asshole. My knight in keratin armor, Kat said. Look, Delgado said, we're just trying to find out what happened. Bobby's the obvious suspect. He was there at the scene of the crime, but it may not be him. In fact... For my daughter's sake, I really hope it's not Bobby or, or any of you. You have a daughter, Kat asked? How old? Uh, she's nine. Huge fan. To Tim, she said, just this morning she was singing deep down at the top of her lungs. She loves your songs. I've written a lot of songs, Tim said, sadly, but that's the one they always bring up first. Well, your words go so well with the music. I mean, the music's so simple and singable, and your words... What, what did you say? Simple? Well, I didn't mean anything about it, just that my daughter... Say what you will about my lyrics, but do not talk about the music that way. You, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I'm sure I don't, but listen to me. There's nothing simple about that music. Even your average pop song has eight, maybe nine unique sounds. And I should pause here for a second. So... <laughs> I was drafting the story and I, I have these children who are both gifted musicians and I wrote to my son and I said look I need a spirited defense of bubblegum pop and I would like to, you to write me a rant defending bubblegum pop and he said I'm on it and he sent me back two pages which I basically copy and pasted here <laughs> what you're about to hear now now I'm not saying as writers, you should raise children specifically to write your books. <laughs> I'm saying it's a pretty good thing when it happens. So I encourage you all to go spawn some right now. Um, OK. Your average pop song, my son wrote to me and I pasted here, has eight, maybe nine unique sounds. Bass, guitar, drums, some synth, and a singer with maybe some backing vocals. And your average boy band ha adds five voices that need to be in every damn song. And that muscles out the other sounds. I mean, they put a lead singer in the middle, put everybody else on three, five interval harmonies, and call it a day. But Wild Boy songs? 
You have no idea. We have all sorts of instrumentals, sometimes 10 distinct sounds at once, plus our vocals, all without overlapping frequencies. Drum machines, percussion samples, synth sounds, real instruments, that guitar on one of a kind, that isn't a patch, it's a real lap steel guitar. Just by production value, our songs are more authentic and more varied than anything anyone else is putting out, and I haven't even gotten to the singing. <laughs> Tim realized he'd gotten to his feet, and his toe claws were digging into the carpet. He didn't care. Look, now Devin the bonobo, thinks it's all about the lead singer. But we put two singers on counterpoint with harmonies and full group harmonies on the choruses, and it works. Do you think it's easy to balance out five voices? Tusk sounds like he's inside a barrel. B Bath blows out our high frequencies, and it's a nightmare in the studio. Then there's all the interplay. We do these crazy starts and stops on syncopated rhythms, and if any one of us messes them up live, it all falls apart. We're performing songs with no room for error while we were dancing. <laughs> now, think about that chorus in Home. Home, you've, you've listened to it. You ever hear that hard right turn like that in another pop song? I mean, one moment we're singing about loneliness and longing, and then bam, a full-on dance beat for 16 bars, then back to the ballad. People like you hear that and think, oh, it's a joke, it's sloppy. No, no way for me, no way. 20 years from now, some young musician is gonna put on that track and hear that change and it will blow their fucking minds. Oh, but let's talk about that simple one, deep down, everybody's goddamn favorite. You know the two gaps in the choruses? You know, we end on a non-functional harmony and then go to total silence. That leaves the listener totally high and dry for a full two seconds before the chorus hits. That's forever in pop music. Fans give it, says it gives them chills, right? Because of our beautiful voices or whatever. But really, it's because it was written to make them need the resolution. And then we withhold it. You ever hear a whole stadium of teenage girls go dead quiet in the middle of a pop concert? That's us. That's what we do. The detectives were staring at him. <laughs> Open mouth. Cat wore a sad smile. Oops, Tim thought. I did it again. <laughs> Go get that. I'm Dr. Moreau from uh, Tour.com Publishing. <sighs> and now for something completely different. Um, uh, these are so different, in fact, that this speaks to my marketing problem as a writer. Um, I apologize now to my agent um, and uh, everybody who's tried to make a living off me. Um, uh, so this next book, and I have to show you this cover as well. So. This is Revelator, out uh, in uh, end of August, uh, came out uh, from Knopf. Um, beautiful cover by this British artist named Dan Hillier. God, you gotta go look at his stuff. Um, and he was working on a cover, we looked at one version, he said, let me just make a cover specifically for the book. So he listened to the audio of the book, and while he was working on it, he was sending me emails, and we were putting, and he was putting stuff into the art as he was working, and he was listening to the book, it was a dream experience as a writer to have that happen. But he's, he's a fabulous artist. Um, Revelator is about, um, well, it takes, it, my family, all, all my relatives came out of uh, East Tennessee. Uh, both sides of my family were kicked out of this park, uh, this part of what became the, the national, the Smoky Mountain um, National Park, at an area called Cades Cove. And they basically eminent domained this out of there and kicked us out. Um, but the nice thing for me is that you can, uh, I can bring my kids back there. Uh, all my ancestors are still buried there. The churches are there. The cabins are there. Um, it's, a, it's a fabulous experience to go back. And I went there as a kid uh, just about every year of my childhood. We would go back at some point into the Smokies and uh, visit Cades Cove. Uh, and we'll be going back there in, uh, for Thanksgiving. Um, so... Um, I was raised, 
uh, in the Southern Baptist Church. I remain a, a disappointment to my family, um, as you might expect. Um, but I wanted to write a story about a family who has their own private God out there. So uh, this is called Revelator. This is from the opening of the book. It's 1933. Stella Wallace met her family's God when she was nine years old. Later, she couldn't figure out why she didn't run when she saw it. It wasn't fear that pinned her to the spot, staring up at it, or even shock. It was something else. Awe, maybe. Wonder so deep it was almost adoration. Pa said she'd been born in the cove, but they'd left when she was too young to remember it. This is where her ma was born, too, and where she'd come back to die when she got sick. Where all the birches before had lived and died. He never told Stella much more about it than that. He was a quiet man. He could go a week, a days on a dozen words like a camel crossing a desert. The day before, they'd spent 12 hours together in the truck going from Chicago to Lexington, and then another four this morning driving into the mountains, and the whole time the only one doing any talking was the truck. Engine whining up the foothills, brakes complaining on the way down, then the biggest climb up to the top of Rich Mountain. At the gap, Pa pulled over to an overlook. He poured water into the Ford's ticking radiator, then rolled himself a cigarette. Stella crept to the edge of the gravel and peered down at a valley spread open like a green pool. Is that it? Is that the cove? Pa nodded. Where's Maddie's house? Her father squinted. Stupid question, she thought. Probably couldn't see it from here. She didn't expect him to answer, and then he pointed his cigarette at a high mountain to the east. Well, that's Thunderhead, and over there, the tip of the cigarette swung south, pointed at a high, round bulge. Uh, that's yours. That's Birch Ball. My mountain, she thought. Not his. Maddie's is straight down from there. They followed the twisting road into a valley as bright and warm as a bowl of light. Pa pulled into a rutted lane, finally rolled to a stop in a grassy clearing in front of a white tin-roofed house. A short ways off to the side, a gray, unpainted barn sat askew as if leaning into a stiff wind. Her father stared at the house for a long minute, sighed, ran a hand through his dark hair. A gray-haired woman came out into the porch, scrawny neck and thick arms in a no-color house dress, a long nose like a hawk, she held a tin can as if she'd just been eating some beans. Pa said, well, got out of the truck, and Stella climbed out after him. The woman was old, and her skin was marked like Stella's, splotches of red on her cheek, her neck, her arms, like a map of an island empire. The old woman's stains were dark, where Stella's were bright red, but there was no mistaking them. They shared the same skin. The woman gestured for Stella to come forward. Stella glanced at her father, but his eyes were on the hills as if he were standing there alone. The old woman gripped Stella's chin, tipped her head sideways, examining those blossoms of red. Stella burned with embarrassment. She kept her arms and legs covered when she could, but nothing could hide the marks on her neck and face. She'd learned, she'd learned to avoid looking strangers in the eye, afraid to see their disgust. Maddie said, you're a birch, all right. Then she turned Stella's wrists and examined her palms. She ain't done hard work, if that's what you're wondering, Pa said. I kept her in school. The old woman grunted, town girl. Pa said to Stella, you stay here. Madi and I need a word. A word close to her father's limit. The two of them went up the steps to the porch, then inside. I'll skip the next few bits in which we get a tour of the farm, which is a lot like my grandmother and grandfather's farm. Uh, chicken roost, a smokehouse with a ham tied up like a prisoner in it that scared the hell out of me. Um, 
a hog uh, behind the fence uh, that charges at Stella, um, charges the fence. And then Stella sees a path winding up into the trees. My, my grandparents' farm was cut into the side of the hill. And so uh, there was actually a, a sort of a, a clay wave that rose up back behind the house. And there were trails back there. And Stella sees a path like that. So after she follows the trail for a while up the mountain, she sees a white shape peeking through the trees. It was a steep-roofed house set into the slope of the mountain, all white clabbered, no windows in front, and only a wide door set at the center. A long, deep scratch zigzagged along the door's surface like a letter from a foreign alphabet. She pulled on the iron handle. It didn't budge. She set her feet and heaved, the lip of the door scraped over a stone threshold. The light behind her showed her rows of church pews, four on each side of a center aisle. She'd gone to church once with a teacher who took pity on her because Pa refused to walk into one. Where the podium should have been was a wide blank stage with some kind of black carpet laid over it. The only window in the church was a small square thing high in the back wall. Where was the cross? Seemed like there ought to be a cross. The air smelled like sawdust. A lick of cold touched her face. She crept forward, led by that feather of, co feather of cold across her nose. And I've cut out a sentence, but I'll skip ahead. Her father would never find her, she thought. He'd sent for search parties and they'd comb the forest and even come into this church and never find this cave. Newspapers would print her picture. She took another step and something in the air changed. A trembling thrum she felt in her chest. She looked around eyes wide against the dark. So she stepped down into the hole. 16 steps. And then she heard another sound penetrating the thrum, a scrape like a knife caressing a stone. And she looked up. Above her, a gleam like moonlight on a china plate. She reached toward it, unsure how far away it was, then froze. The pale, smooth surface belonged to something very large. She could barely see it and couldn't make out its shape, but she could feel it. The presence loomed over her, gazing down, listening to her, every breath in her lungs a roar. She couldn't move. The scrape came again. A limb, a long, chalky limb, flat as a blade, eased toward her. Other limbs unfolded. It descended like a spider. Something seized the back of her neck. She screamed. A hand gripped her jaw. How did you get in here? Her grandmother shouting in her face out of the dark, so furious. She pulled Stella toward the steps and shoved her up. She fell onto the altar floor. After the dark of the cave, the church seemed so much brighter. Madi climbed out of the hole, cursing. She picked up the plank with surprising ease, dropped it across the hall. Stella blinked up at her, afraid. I'm sorry, I, I don't. You never go in here, do you hear? Stella nodded and Madi said, say it. I'll never. The old woman yanked her to her feet. Your father's calling for you, now get go. She didn't know what she'd seen and didn't have a name for it. She wouldn't know either of those things for a long while. All right, that's the book. So we're going to try something new. We're going to do a little Q&A. This is something we did online. Um, you know, we don't have a, a mic to pass around, so anyone have any questions, just raise your hand. And there you go, uh, for either of the authors. Sure. Sure, why not? If they remember it. For Daryl Gregory, I really enjoyed We Are All Completely Fine. And um, I've noticed that in recent years there seems to be a trend 
Yeah, should I do the mic? So, yeah, sure. All right, all right. Well, like Michael and I can. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always this thing in fiction where it's uh, suddenly it's uh, some call it steam engine time, some call it asteroid time, and all of a sudden the movies come out where there's an asteroid coming and, and various people have to blow it up. Um, it's just something that happens in fiction all the time. So you have an idea, and s sometimes people are working on books for years, and then when they finally get published, there are similar books with similar themes coming out at the, you know, at the same time. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can ask them to send you checks, uh, <laughs> but, but they usually ignore all my mail. So uh, yeah, that, it's just a thing that happens. And um, yeah, uh, and so that book, I, I did have once after that book, somebody had a similar theme and wrote me a permission email. I'm like, of course. I mean, there's nothing original. Who, I stole a dozen things in that story from other books that I was recasting in that therapy book. Uh, from Lovecraft, I took things. I took things from, um, uh, uh, there's snippets from the Ring series, like uh, if the horror movies, uh, like Ringu and those movies. Um, it's just a thing. It's, you know, it's the ecstasy of influence at work. tagging out, Matt. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, there's this tradition of the Southern Gothic, right, where, where that uh, steamy, humid atmosphere, where um, especially when there's old-time religion, there's America's racist past, everything's, you know, uh, you know we sort of uh, built farms on poisoned ground in a way, you know. Um, all of that stuff is there, and in Southern fiction, there's this also it works well with horror because there's this idea, you know, it comes from Faulkner, and that you you can't escape the past. The past is always with you. So it's a, it's a fiction that works really well for horror in that um, even if the surface is beautiful and lush, um, there's something. There's the smell of rot underneath that's really interesting. And so you're right. Any, anything in any fiction can be, can be um, overplayed to the point of cliche, and then it loses its power. So every writer is always skating this line between drawing from the influences of previous things and using them, um, and wanting to say something new that takes those traditions and takes that atmosphere, which could be pushed one way into parody, can instead be, you know, used for actual uh, emotional effects. So it's always, a, I mean, uh, people are always struggling with this idea. It's the same, like with Michael's, like with um, uh, with Night Roll, like you've you've got this idea of the crumbling city. And I remember visiting visiting Detroit. And I don't know if you want to talk about, like, how do you use some of those things, like uh, about the weird city atmosphere. And like what you what you felt like you could use and what you felt like you should stay away from. Do you want to? I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, about definitely. That. Get up here. Get up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know how to do that. I open it. No, it's oh, the I can? No, I, just, I had to open it when we started. Just push down. Just pull this down. is a quite a gothic window. <laughs> yeah, uh, talk about atmosphere. It just closes and opens. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so gothic setting and past. Uh, Detroit is a dark and messed up place. Um, I'm, I'm not from there. I've lived there for 10 years now. Uh, I find it incredibly compelling. Uh, one of the seeds for Night Roll is the, the 1967 uh, race riots slash rebellion. In, in Night Roll, we, ref we refer to it as the rebellion, which is the appropriately... It is, it is what progressives in Detroit want you to call it. Um, they sent in the National Guard. There were murders by police. Um, so how do you decide what you're going to use and what you're not going to use maybe in that yeah I don't have I don't have any authenticity I feel very humble in Detroit um, I'm trying to do I'm trying to do right by it in a way that I could not ever hope to do right by Southern Gothic uh I've tried to do Northern Gothic in the past because I'm from Boston. I'm from uh, New England, and who get who has ownership of this stuff? I mean, uh, Stephen King in Maine. Right, right. Of course, Stephen King uh, takes ownership of it, and you you have this long past. Uh, and to me, like the essence of Detroit, Detroit is eighty percent black now because all the white people fled from it, and so that. Hmm, if you set foot there, it is impossible to avoid the racial conflict that is its foundation to me. Uh, and it's dark, and it has uh, dread that isn't appropriate. And I think that, I think it does share something with Southern Gothic because there was this whole uh, uh, the Great Migration. Uh, in which black people fled the south coming up to the north because there were uh, <coughs> perceived to be safer political climate for them. But that safer political climate was fake, you know. Uh, and I, th I think it does share something with, you know, the deliverance uh, creepiness of terrifying reactionaries. And... Uh, I can't, I, I totally have no authenticity in that. All, all I can do is do the research and try and represent it. Uh, you know, am I succeeding at that? It is hard to say. This isn't the best response. Come on, come back up and give me your version. <laughs> Any other questions? What are you guys working on? Wait, wait, wait. 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, when somebody sends you an email saying, um, we'd like you to write a story for an anthology, and Ellen has done this to me, um, my tendency is to say yes, and then later, panic. Um, because I don't, when I usually say yes, have any idea that matches the theme at all, but it's sort of like you know, holding a gun to your head and... Uh, one part of your brain is holding another gun to the other part of your brain and saying, come up with something. Um, so I think Hansel and Gretel still hadn't been taken in that anthology. And uh, so what the story is about is sort of a modern telling of uh, Hansel and Gretel in which... Um, <laughs> yeah, you're, it's fiction. You don't want to be here, man. It's, 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 um, 
especially not during the Q&A section. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it's Hansel and Gretel, you wandered in and now you can't get out of the house. Um, so I, I just had this, I, I had this technology from a novel of mine called After Party in which uh, you, could, you could basically print your own drugs. You could, down, you could download recipes. There were canisters that let you, uh, you could put them into a, like an equivalent of a 3D printer and, and shoot out uh, chemicals that you could eat this paper and take. Um, and because I'm a lazy person, I thought maybe I could reuse this for this short story. So a person uses one of these 3D, printer, 3D printers and prints drugs all over the house and papers the walls with them and basically makes it a wall of adult candy. And then these teenagers come in when he's not looking and start eating all the paper um, and they start having these crazy hallucinogenic effects. Um, and I also thought, well, okay, this should be a comedy, of course, um, because what's funnier than rampant drug use? Um, so it's it's like, um, and, and Michael's written more stories, short stories than I have. I mean, but there's this, I don't know if the process is like this for you, is that you you start collecting bits and pieces, and then you you fool around with them and trying to see what sticks together. And, and, and the only good thing that comes when you, over years of writing a lot of stories is that you get a sense for what will stick together maybe and and you have enough craft maybe to make it pull off um, but for me always is um, the story doesn't work for me until I know what the ending is and what the emotional effect is supposed to be because if I don't have that then the story doesn't have any heart and the story just feels dead to me and I'm just doing plot mechanics to make uh, make it work and but it feels dead and so for me the actual rescuing of these kids turned out to be the little bit of a turn, even though it was a comic story, that made me think, oh, okay, I know, where the, I know what the story is at its heart. Like, I know what the emotional piece is. Um, I just wrote a crazy story for Ellen uh, that is a, the, 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 the goofiest monster story I've ever written, but it didn't work for me until I knew what the last couple sentences were and what the heart of it was. Um, and that, that's what made it come alive for me. I don't know if that's answering any of your questions, but that's, it's, it's a weird process. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you, well, like, what's your process? Like, do you have, or well, is it different for every story? To add to what you were just saying, I mean, I, I have found that there is no amount of material that is too much to fit into a tiny short story. <laughs> You just pile it all on there, and then some of it doesn't end up on the page. But uh, volumes and volumes go in there, and ideas and ideas. And I, I used to try to write based on one cool, clever premise, and there was never enough there for me. Uh, as you're saying, it is all about the payoff, the emotional payoff. Um, but it's amazing how much you can cram in. <laughs> so what are each of you working on now? I'm working on a short story series. Uh, I'm calling it Ecological Horror, with the horror removed and replaced with awe. Um, I edit Reckoning, which is a magazine about of uh, speculative writing, mostly about environmental justice. Um, and so that's where my head is all the time now, climate change. Um, I live right near Flint, which perhaps you know about the lead poisoning and all that, and that's happening all across Michigan and all across the U.S. Uh, these are matters of great concern to me. And uh, getting back to the authenticity thing, like I don't, Flint again is another city that is full of black folks and not me. Uh, and the way I try and think about that and address it is uh, through a much more personal lens. Um, so I'm trying to do this urban fantasy thing that addresses where we all are right now. Uh, hurricanes and wildfires and I just had to buy a uh, air filter. I'm sure you all, all you New Yorkers have those already. Uh, but it was it was an emotional experience for me getting that and needing it to sleep, you know, and what that means for my kid who ne who needs it to sleep and what that's going to mean for his allergies in ten years, and uh, 
what it's going to mean for all of us in 10 years. Uh, and I'm trying to represent it in a way that is not completely despairing. Um, but the tools of horror just seem baked into all that. Like, it's, it's horrifying to conceive of our future right now. Uh, but I don't want to just dwell in it. Uh, I, I'm reading a lot of submissions that are about this stuff and are super bleak. Uh, and I don't, I don't find any way to move forward from that. So I'm trying to focus on what, the awe of what we're losing, I guess. Uh, and that's compelling to me, and I hope it's compelling to someone. We shall see. I think it will end up being a collection of stories that all follow this theme. Uh, what am I working on? I, I usually hate this question when, like, back in the days when we had book tours, uh, you'd, you'd be showing people your new book, and they would say, okay, what are you working on now? And it'd be like, you'd just come out of the hospital with a new baby, and you're like, well, that one looks good, but what do you wor what's your next one? Uh, and you're like, but can't we just talk about this baby? Um, I haven't even named it yet. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about the novel I'm, I'm working on because I don't want to spook it. You know, you don't, want to, you don't want to have it get the wrong idea and start running away from you. But it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of crazy large, and this time it's science fiction, and it's nothing like the previous books. And so once again... Uh, I have some, uh, I'll have an uncomfortable conversation with my agent about <laughs> how to sell another change in genre, so. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, I don't want to go home with this. Um, so if anyone, uh, I don't know how to determine whether to just throw this out into the crowd, but anyone would like a free copy of Revelator, somehow, oh, you're the first to raise your hand. You get a free copy of Revelator. Um, <laughs> Oh, and I, I can. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I love Sorry. you guys. Is there one more yes. question back there? I don't know. Oh, is there another question back there? Any more questions? Question. I, I, I think uh, you said before, Matt, that uh, beer is one of your, your other loves. <laughs> do, you, do you see it as a metaphor for creating fiction and deciding on how to do a recipe for a beer? Because you know, you never really quite know what you're going to come out with, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, Thank you so much. I'm so I excited. Helped a, I helped a friend with this for the first time, and I'm like, you get to wait six weeks or eight weeks to find out what this is going to be, even though there's a recipe, and he's like, and maybe it's not going to be that. You only think it is, right? Right. I, I find it incredibly rewarding, and I totally do see it as a metaphor for fiction. Uh, I, I do it... When, when my fiction gets frustrating, which it often does, and I'm sure it does for everyone, uh, the nice thing about the beer is that you, uh, you don't have to wait for someone else to approve it. You can decide what you think of it, and you don't, as you're saying, you don't have control over it. Uh, as, as Scott Andrews, my friend and editor of Beneath the Sky, says, I brew with shit I find in the woods. Uh, so it's a lot of very weird, wild things that maybe no one has ever tasted. Uh, and I have an intent where I want to, like, you know, bring these, these ancient brewing things, medieval brewing, uh, Native American hallucinogens. Not that I've succeeded with this, mind you, but, uh, yeah. And then you get to try and convince other people to be willing to try it, which is very much like with fiction. <laughs> except this, like, you know it's going to make them drunk at the very least. So there is a... Uh, in some ways, it is more rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I have a question in the back, though. I have a question for Daryl. Last, last question. Last question from, Go from for the bearded it. man in the back. Speaking about uh, writing uh, for theme anthologies and about appropriation, like you wrote a story for Glitter and Mayhem. Yeah, well, 
Bill, Let's didn't you write a see. story for that anthology as well? Uh, yeah, he, another yeah, Bowie story is back. Another Bowie story. Yes. Yeah. Um, Bowie's our guy, right? I mean, he was our—he's our science fiction poet. I mean, uh, I remember being handed uh, at that time, you know, a cassette tape of of uh, uh, of uh, which one was it? Like, the, it was the Changes. Bowie. It was the best of Bowie, where they showed the blue and green eyes. Uh, uh, Changes. Uh, no, it wasn't Changes. It was like a, like a KTEL like best of mixtape of Bowie and it just wrecked me and so I played that until it fell apart um, so you do this thing and and uh, in that story I basically the, the the challenge was to throw in as many songs to many references to Bowie songs as I possibly could and still have it not fall apart and I don't think that story actually succeeded um, I have I I it's one of those stories where I wrote where I wish I could take a second crack at that story. Um, but God bless David Bowie and uh, David Byrne and all the other Davids who uh, helped out a young Daryl Gregory. Uh, felt like that was the soundtrack to science fiction. All right, great last question. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Michael. Thanks to uh, all of you for coming and the KGB Bar. So we will see you next month in person. And don't forget to buy drinks at the bar. So. And tip your bartender. Yeah. You have been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.